This video shows the entire process of making a 1940s petticoat. This garment is part of a larger project, which is the recreation of what a civilian woman would have worn when working at Bletchley Park between the years of 1941 and 1945, those being the years that clothing was rationed in Britain. The petticoat is the final piece I made out of a total of four garments. There are several things shown in the video that do not end up as part of the final garment. They are, however, part of my process, which is why they are included in the video. The numbers shown on screen correspond with the footnotes provided. The video will alternatively go between narration during the process and voiceover recorded after. I'll begin with the drafting of the pattern. So this is the Haslam system of dress cutting that um, are released, was released from, I want to say the 20s through the 60s, um, in these booklets that give um, adaptions to base patterns so you can make the garments um, pictured. So I don't have the base pattern book because it was too expensive to buy, but I do have this adaption on that. Um, and I'm looking at making the petticoat, which is this section of this uh, slip. So it's this section down here. Um, and I don't have all of the dimensions that I need in order to be able to draft this on paper, so I'm going to blow it up and trace it onto this paper here and then grid it so that I can um, expand, expand it into full size. I know that line is the waistline. This dimension has to be one quarter of my waist, which is seven inches. So this has to be divided into seven. Each square of the grid represents one inch. I also like to number each line so that it's easier to transfer the shape when drawing it full size. Next step was to reorganize my living room to make room for the drafting paper on the floor. I have a large roll of brown paper that I draft all my patterns on. The two main tools I use for drafting are my clear ruler and a yardstick. Here I'm transferring the shape from the gridded paper to the brown paper and I'm working in inches. Then I have to iron the pattern flat so I can use it to cut a mock-up. When ironing paper, I always use a hot iron and no steam. I then double check the length of the petticoat by holding a tape measure against my waist to see how long I wanted it to be. Three inches. I need three more inches on this. I started by weighing down the first draft of the pattern so that I could trace it and extend it by three inches to make it the correct length. On this second draft, I also added half-inch seam allowances so that I would be able to sew it more easily into a mock-up. Here is the mock-up, and it's clearly not fitting around my hips. I find another solution for this pattern, however, while editing the video, I discovered why it wasn't fitting. Looking back at the page where I got the pattern from, this is the pattern that I drafted. I realized that it was only the back panel, and I should have also drafted this one, which is the front. Together, these two panels make up the skirt for this slip. Basically, I was trying to make a skirt with only half of the pattern. Unfortunately, I realized this after I'd completed the petticoat. So, here is how I solved the problem instead. So here I have version 2 of the petticoat pattern and the front panel of the 1940s skirt that I've made that you can see on the dress form here. Um, they're pretty similar in shape apart from that sort of front kick pleat. Like it is just a skirt shape um, from the 40s with a curved bottom. The, the thing that I was most worried about with this was the fact that the waistline is straight and not curved and from my experience with previous petticoats um, most of them have a curved top because your waist is a curved line. So in these books that I have, this one is Needlework and Cutting Out, um, originally published in 1897. This is a reprint from the 1920s with some new information in it. In the section under underskirts, you can see the patterns that they have here and all of the waistbands are curved. 
I'm going to even have a section here that shows you how to draw a curved waistband that you would then attach onto these um, underskirts, and underskirts obviously here meaning petticoat. Um, so this book was reprinted in the 1920s, and then this book here, um, which is Needlework and Cutting Out by Jane A. Strachan, um, this doesn't have a section particularly on underskirts, but you do see, um, for example, in this combination garment drawing, um, the waistband is a very curved seam, or it's a curved line. It's not straight. Um, they don't have a section particularly just on petticoats, um, but you do see that the waistband continues to be curved even in the 20s when this book was published. But I completely didn't take into account that, of course, that wasn't going to fit my hip measurement. So I think maybe what I need to do is take this skirt shape, ignore the pleat, cut that right out, and cut that skirt shape there um, with the hemline because that's roughly, roughly the right height, maybe a little bit higher. But I think that that will give me the shape that I need now that I've drafted this shape and realized sort of a bit more about the shape um, and the alterations that need to be made for it in order so it actually fits. I'm ignoring the back panel here because it has the darts in it and I didn't see that on petticoat patterns um, and I don't think it's strictly necessary so I think I'll be able to get away with it with just this front section. I then cut and sewed a mock-up of the skirt front cutting two pieces on the fold to make a front and a back. Okay, so it's a little bit around the waist. That can be adjusted easily enough. I might make some adjustments on this and then uh, transfer that over to the pattern. So now I'm just transferring the marks that I made, the adjustments that I made on the mock-up over to the actual pattern. So I'm folding back to the seam line there and just really lightly drawing this in. So I have two 40s, 30s, 40s um, slip slash nightgowns um, here, one in the front and one in the back. You can see uh, one is obviously way more wrinkled than the other. Uh, the one in the front, the slightly darker one, is not cut on the bias. Um, and then this one behind is cut on the bias. So depending on how much fabric I have available, um, I'll either do the petticoat on the bias if I have the fabric available, and if I don't, then I'll cut it not on the bias, and I know that both ways are uh, acceptable based on these two slips. Then before cutting out my pieces, I made sure to iron really well the silk that I was going to use. I do have enough fabric to cut these on the bias, um, but I've just pinned this on and I'm thinking that in the Second World War, first of all, silk was rationed and you couldn't get silk for clothing. Um, and so you probably wouldn't be wasting this much fabric cutting it on the bias. So I think that I'm going to take this off and cut it on the straight grain in order to save fabric, which is much more in the make, do, and mend ethos than uh, wasting a lot of fabric just to cut something on the bias and get a better look. When I traced the pattern out, I completely forgot to include the iteration I made to the pattern from the mock-up. This would come back to haunt me later. And then here I'm pinning the edges since I was cutting this on the fold and needed the layers to stay together when cutting tried to pin as close to the edge as possible because I know silk tends to show pin marks more than other fabrics. So I have a selection of curved waistbands in various different um, lengths. Here's a 29 inch waistband which is pretty close to what I need. Um, this is half, so I'll cut four of these out of this silk. I did not end up using these waistbands as I found another solution for how to finish the waist. However, I include this as it was part of the process even if it didn't end up in the final garment. The next steps of pinning, basting, and sewing repeat themselves multiple times over the rest of this video. Here I am pinning and then basting the side seams. When it came to sewing the seams on the machine, I initially started out using an old needle which turned out to be dull. You can see here it was causing the threads in the fabric to pucker. I changed the needle and the puckering stopped. After sewing the seams, I was able to remove the basting threads, which you can see here. So here's all my 30s or 40s silk underwear, or possibly sleepwear, some of it. 
um, and I'm trying to decide what to do with the seams and with the placket or closure on the petticoat. So when I looked at the seams in these possibly slips, possibly um, sleeping wear, all of the seams are actually left raw, which is really interesting. Some of them are left completely raw and left to fray. Or for example, in this one here, the seam is pinked here. Um, you can see the zigzag that's left there. Um, this one, again, is just left raw. And then this garment here, which is a pair of underwear, is entirely um, hand-sewn, which is really interesting. So I get to see some hand-sewn garments. It was likely, um, if it was hand-sewn at this time, it was probably quite an expensive, high-end piece. Um, but I do like the way that the waistband is done, which is just one piece put under, like basically sewed together and then flipped over. So the front looks fairly smooth and is just sewn and uh, sewed down on the back side with what looks to be a running stitch. And then this closure is just a, um, a strip of fabric that's sewn on. It's one straight piece that's put on. Buttonholes are made on one side. Buttons are sewn on the other side. And it closes up quite nicely. It doesn't need to be as clean as a uh, outer garment because obviously the only person seeing this is you or whoever else sees your underwear so that's quite an intimate thing and people aren't looking at the details of this in quite the same way. Um, so I think I'm going to copy this for sure, this closure here, and I may also copy this one. We'll see. I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do. I've cut a waistband but I don't know if I'm going to put a waistband on or if I'll just do this. I went in with my pinking shears and pinked the side seams of the petticoat. I also ripped two strips of fabric with a selvage edge, one for the placket and one for finishing the waist. Here I'm marking a half inch seam allowance on the placket with a pencil. This will give me a straight line to stitch on. And again, pinning and then basting the placket. I stitched the placket on by hand using a running back stitch. This is a running stitch with a back stitch every time you pull the needle through, which is about every three to four stitches. The thread I used is a very fine cotton thread as I was out of white silk thread and in the make, do and mend ethos, I was trying to buy as little as possible for this project. Once stitched, I press the placket flat and then in half. I also trim the seam allowances back to about a quarter of an inch. Here I am stitching the back of the placket down with a felling stitch. This clip makes me very proud. It's not often that I get to take a step back and watch myself at work. The ease with which I'm stitching here shows me that all the time I've put into improving my sewing skills has paid off. The way I'm holding the fabric here, tensioning it between my thumb and middle finger over the index, is demonstrated in the book Needlework and Cutting Out, both on the cover and in the book itself. It is here in trying on the petticoat I realized I didn't make the adjustment to the pattern from the mock-up. Oh dear. <laughs> Uh, so way too big. I ended up taking all the excess out of the side of the skirt without the placket and making the curve as gradual as possible to avoid the skirt hanging weird. Repeat the steps of pinning, basting, and sewing with a strip of fabric for the waist. Again, for sewing, I'm using a running back stitch. After sewing and removing the basting threads, I trim the seam allowances back to a quarter of an inch. The same as I did with the placket, the seam is pressed flat and then over. I then ran a running stitch along the top edge and then the bottom edge of the strip of fabric. I tried to keep my stitches as small as possible. Here you can see a comparison between my petticoat and the 30s and 40s underwear. I have a small collection of antique buttons. I chose this small shell button and sewed it onto the placket using strong silk thread. Again, using the same thread, I sewed the buttonhole onto the other side. So I have the petticoat on and all done with the exception of the hem. For the hem, I'm gonna take the skirt off of the dress form and put that on and make sure that the hem is above the hem of the skirt um, so that you can't see the petticoat when I have the skirt on. Um, 
And then I haven't decided if I'm going to do it on the machine or by hand yet. It's here that my camera cut out, so you miss me putting on the skirt on top of the petticoat and marking the length. So I've gone in, figured out the line that I put on the petticoat, which is basically at my knee. I then measured up from the bottom, the same all the way along, and now I'm going to cut it off. And now I have to work very carefully because I have a clean edge now to get it ready to hem. Working very carefully, trying to disturb the fabric as little as possible, I folded the cut edge up and under and pinned it into place. I tried to keep the hem about a quarter of an inch thick. The hems of both of the 30s, 40s petticoats that I have are both machine stitched in very different ways. You can tell that's machine based on the slip stitch on the back. And this has obviously got a double stitch around here, but it is just turned up. Like this isn't an additional piece added onto the back. The last step for me was to sew my hem on the machine. And so here is the final petticoat on the dress form. You can see the button, the buttonhole, and waistband. Here you can see the placket. And finally, here I am putting on the petticoat and skirt.